to Belmont Journal, Belmont's new show and community update. I'm your host, Maribel Carvajal de Salazar. Today, I want to give a big shout out to Frederick Brugelow, our former news director. We want to wish you the best in your new chapter of life. Thank you for all your work. On Tuesday, February 8th, from 1 to 3 p.m., join us to make a watercolor Valentine card workshop with Audrey Child to the Belmont Senior Center. Make a calendar to give it to yourself or to a loved one. No previous experience necessary. Supplies will be available. If you have a watercolor brushes, bring them with you. And if you never painted before, no worry about it. The steps are easy. Register to the 617-993-2976. Or you can also register through the online program. Summer Club Takeout Edition. February 8th at the Beach Street Center at 4.30 p.m. They are hosting a supper club a little different. Order from Joyful Garden and enjoy it with your friends in the center. Call and register to the 617-993-2976 for more info. Introduction to cold process soap making, Tuesday, February 15th at 11 a.m. Each student will make their own one pound batch of soap that will get to take home with them. The molds and everything will be provided and students will leave with a very true hands out and enough information to make awesome vegetable based natural soap. To register, please call Dana Pickerman at 617-993-2977 or email her to the Senior Center. I had the opportunity to interview the Chief of the Belmont Fire Department, Chief De Stefano. here with you. Hi, and welcome to Belmont Journal, Belmont's new show and community update. I'm your host, Maribel Carvajal de Salazar. Today with us, we have the Chief of the Belmont Fire Department, Chief David De Stefano. Thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Maribel. It's, it's great to be here. I appreciate it. So, uh, Chief, this weekend we had a big storm. Can you share any incident and emergencies that you helped? Sure. Yeah. During the storm, uh, we did respond to a number of incidents. Uh, in fact, during the height of the storm, uh, we had several incidents simultaneously. Uh, we had a small fire that we responded to, uh, and there were several medical incidents uh, that occurred at the same time, uh, which were handled mostly by our, our mutual aid partners uh, in using their resources. Uh, we did have some extra staffing working for the storm, uh, and that worked out to our advantage in being able to respond to this fire very rapidly uh, and arriving very quickly with enough resources to handle the situation um, uh, in a very efficient manner. So uh, that was something that really worked to our advantage. We happened to have a unit that was uh, literally right around the corner when the call came in, and uh, that unit arrived on scene uh, within moments of receiving the call. So it worked out very well. Uh, damage was held to a, a very minimal amount of damage and um, there were no injuries. Uh, the other incidents that we handled during the storm uh, were more or less uh, typical incidents that could occur on any other day. Uh, just uh, having them uh, during that severe weather just kind of exacerbated the situation with our response and uh, getting through the snow to handle those type of calls. But uh, we, were, we were fortunate in that the snow was light. Uh, it was a Saturday. Um, a lot of people did heed the warnings to stay home uh, and we made it through okay. Great. And there's also an initiative called Adopt a Hydrant. Can you please share our community about it? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, we're, we're very, very appreciative of folks that uh, do take advantage of this and and go out and uh, shovel out uh, the hydrant that's closest to their home. We, we very, very much appreciate that. <clears throat> The day after the storm, Sunday, uh, we had uh, every member that was working uh, was out shoveling hydrants uh, for probably about five or six hours, perhaps even a little more. Uh, and, and as you know, it was extremely cold on Sunday. So they were out for a, a good long time in the cold uh, shoveling out hydrants. If we can get any assistance at all with this, it's greatly appreciated because, you know, with 11 people working, uh, we can't get all the hydrants done immediately. Uh, and certainly a fire can happen at any time. So uh, it really is helpful to us to have the hydrant shoveled out uh, and just as importantly, helpful to the people in the neighborhood because uh, that's our water supply. That hydrant that's closest to your house uh, is going to be our water supply to put out uh, a potential fire at your house. So we need to really all work together to get, uh, get that done. So if you could 
possibly get out there uh, after it stops snowing as long as it's safe to do so and uh, give us a, a three foot by three foot uh, clear area around the hydrant. We greatly appreciate that. We'll come by, we'll see it, and uh, we'll be very happy about that. And uh, you know, if it's not done, if you don't have an opportunity to do it, we'll certainly get to it. We may not get to it uh, immediately that first day, but uh, you know, we'll get to it as soon as we can. And talking about winter, there has been a series of uh, ice rescues made in the area. Can you please share uh, what has been about and the message you have for our community? Sure. Um, in the last couple of weeks, uh, neighboring communities have had a number of incidents. In fact, I believe there were three or four incidents just in the course of one Sunday a couple of weeks ago uh, with uh, people and or animals uh, falling through the ice and nearby bodies of water. So we uh, would just like to remind people that the ice uh, or the water uh, uh, bodies of water in your area may not be safe to, to walk on or play on or skate on. Uh, you know, we have had some cold weather uh, and certainly people might think that the ice is safe and in certain areas of a body of water, the ice may be thick. Uh, in other parts of that same body of water, the ice may be very, very thin and it's difficult to determine that. Uh, so we would really ask that people stay off the ice, keep your pets off the ice. Uh, we don't want folks going out after pets onto the ice. Uh, if that does occur, give us a call. We'll, we'll go out there and make a rescue using the uh, the appropriate equipment. But we would prefer not to put uh, our people in harm's way and certainly not to put um, residents in harm's way uh, going out onto ice that may not be safe. Um, there is a website that's available, uh, which I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll share with folks later in the broadcast uh, that they can check with uh, uh, Commonwealth um, uh, Mass um, DE, uh, DEP um, website regarding uh, ice safety and uh, they can check out the local bodies of water and see if they are safely frozen for uh, recreation. Great. We will have the website in the banner of the screen to, um, to do that. And also uh, the group of firefighters received a training for um, water res rescue operations. Can you share about that? Right. Yeah, uh, actually, this is, I think, a great opportunity to point out to everyone watching uh, that we'd really love if you followed us on social media. Uh, we're uh, active on basically all the popular social media platforms, and this was one of the items that we shared uh, maybe a week or two ago. We, uh, we did uh, take advantage of the pool at the high school uh, to conduct some water rescue training uh, using our exposure suits, and we have a couple of photographs of our firefighters doing that at the pool. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to use the pool. Great training, re great training resource for us and great opportunity to do that. Um, so we, we train on, on this type of thing uh, at least a couple of times a year. We try and do something in the winter. We try and do something in the, in the warmer weather. Um, but this was a, a water rescue training using our exposure suits. And actually, uh, we have some additional training coming up in February. We'd like to uh, do some ice rescue training. So we should be out on the ice in February doing some um, person through the ice type of uh, scenarios uh, for rescue training. And we'll be sure to document that. We'll let you know. Uh, when we're doing that, and uh, we'll certainly post some updates on that. But it's it's important for us to to stay on top of those type of topics, uh, and certainly it's pertinent to uh, to the weather. Also, the department was awarded with a grant for a firefighter safety equipment. How will this help the department? Uh, that's a great question, and that that money is going to be a great help to us. So uh, in January, we were awarded uh, eighteen thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars, just about nineteen thousand. <laughs> Uh, by the Department of Fire Services uh, to purchase equipment to assist uh, in resident and firefighter safety. So this is a, a great opportunity to get some money uh, infused into the department to purchase some equipment that we probably wouldn't be able to buy otherwise, or if we did, it would be very impactful of our budget. So uh, this is um, a, a great opportunity to kind of beef up some of our response capabilities, and we're using it to purchase some things that are um, helpful universally uh, that will help firefighters that are in trouble, it will help uh, residents that are in trouble. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, each of those items. So we, we've purchased a, a new forcible entry tool. Uh, we have a couple of these tools in the department already, and this will certainly add to our inventory of equipment uh, that allows us to more rapidly access uh, buildings and enforce uh, doors in apartment type buildings and in um, commercial and residential type buildings that allows us to um, make forcible entry of these doors very efficiently um, and will certainly speed up the process of us getting in to uh, make rescues and affect fire suppression efforts. So we're really happy to have that. 
Uh, we also uh, just received uh, what is called a fast board. And uh, this type of device actually facilitates the movement of either civilians or firefighters who may be trapped either in a fire or require extrication in some other type of rescue scenario. It, it's something that we can strap on to folks, uh, whether civilian or firefighter, and uh, facilitate their movement out of a dangerous area. So it's, it's just something that makes the, that, that removal or that rescue process just much more efficient and much safer for everybody involved. So it's great to have that. We purchased one with our, out of our operating budget uh, a number of months ago. Uh, we were only able to purchase one at that point. This gives us the additional capabilities. So what we're going to do is we're going to have one of these devices uh, on each side of town uh, in each station. So we can uh, have that capability rapidly accessible all the time. Uh, we're also uh, purchasing some new rescue harnesses. Uh, we had rescue harnesses in the department that uh, aged out. Uh, after a certain number of years, uh, they are no longer able to be certified for use in life safety applications. So those older harnesses aged out. Uh, we, um, we had to put those out of service. We were not able to immediately purchase new ones. Uh, this grant um, enables us to do that. Uh, and it comes in a great time because we have some uh, technical rescue and confined space rescue training that's gonna be coming up in the spring. So we'll have brand new harnesses uh, to learn uh, and brush up on those skills with uh, in the spring. So great timing for that. Uh, the other uh, couple of items we received are, uh, we've had vehicle stabilization struts uh, in our inventory of equipment for quite some time in the department. They're great devices. Uh, they can be used uh, in, in several different rescue platforms. What we find ourselves using them uh, most often as uh, is devices to stable rolled over vehicles or vehicles that are, are, are not stable. Uh, and we found that there are some other pieces of equipment that go along with these struts that would make our job a little easier, safer, and more efficient. Uh, some base plates and some additional strap devices. Uh, again, that we're able to purchase with this grant money uh, that didn't impact our operating budget and are going to make deployment of this device or these devices uh, much easier uh, and much more efficient and, and certainly much safer for everybody involved. So it was a, a great purchase as well. Uh, the other item that we're purchasing uh, also kind of related to vehicle extrication. Uh, you may remember probably about six months ago, we purchased some battery powered um, uh, extrication tools. Yeah, everyone has probably heard of the Jaws of Life. So these are tools that are made by the same company uh, using the same principles as the Jaws of Life, only instead of uh, running from a gasoline powered engine, uh, they're, they're run by battery power. Uh, makes them quiet, uh, makes them extremely portable. You're not te tethered to a cord or, or, a, um, or an engine. Uh, and we were able to use these tools that we purchased a number of months ago immediately upon receiving them. Uh, the, the week after we put them on the truck, uh, we were using them to extricate a person from a, an automobile that was pinned in the auto. Uh, we've used them a number of times since then, uh, up, up to and including, uh, I believe it was last week, uh, we had an automobile extrication. And I believe that's also posted on social. You can go back and take a look on our media, social media platforms and check out that extrication. But uh, the point is we're able to purchase yet another one of these tools uh, to add to our cadre of equipment. We have a spreader to, to pull apart doors and pieces of uh, an automobile or other product. Uh, and we have a cutter to, to cut those uh, items as well. Uh, and this next item that we're purchasing with this grant money is called a RAM and it's used to push uh, pieces of an automobile or other piece of machinery apart to create a space where we can effect a rescue. So this is basically the trifecta of tools that are available. We've had the first two and now we'll, we'll get the, the final piece to that, uh, that trifecta of tools. So we'll be fully equipped and uh, the firefighters really uh, appreciate these tools. Uh, they're happy to have received the first two uh, using our operating budget. And I think they'll be happy to receive this, this final tool because it helps us do our job more efficiently, helps us affect rescues more quickly. So that's the, really the name of the game when it comes to extrication, that, that golden hour of getting people uh, into a trauma center. Please share our appreciation to every member of the department. We are very grateful for your work and thank you for being with us tonight. Well, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed it and I appreciated you having me on. Thank you. And joining us today, Joanna Jubilis, the multimedia journalist from Wicked Local and Belmont Citizen Herald. Hi, Joanna. Hi, Maribel. Thank you. And we have some news about town election. Yes, Maribel, the town election is coming up. It's April 5th. 
And anyone interested in running for town meeting or townwide position has until February 15th to file their nomination papers with the town clerk. And according to our town clerk, Ellen O'Brien Cushman, there are still plenty of openings for town meeting members in all eight precincts. I have two, you know, a few important updates on the election uh, for regarding townwide positions. So right now, officially on the ballot, we have select board candidate, which is Roy Epstein. He is running for re-election to his seat, and currently he is uncontested. No one else has pulled or filed papers for the select board seat. So we'll see what happens by February 15th with that. There are two official candidates for two three-year school committee seats currently on the ballot. No one else has filed. One other resident has pulled, but she hasn't filed yet. So officially on the ballot, we have Amy Checkaway. She's running for re-election to her three-year seat. She'll, you know, she's finishing up her three-year term. She's currently serving as the chair on the school committee and she is running for re-election. The other person running who recently filed his papers just this week is Jeffrey Liberty. Jeffrey Liberty is not really a newcomer to the school committee. He actually was a finalist two times in the past for appointments when there were vacancies when school, uh, school committee chair Susan Burgess Cox resigned and when Andrea Prestes resigned, he stepped up to the plate, put in an application. He was actually, actually a finalist twice for both of those positions, but in the end, they ended up choosing someone else. So I admire him for filing. He definitely seems very interested. He has a background in education. He has two children currently in the school system. And right now there's no race for school committee, but. Again, there is one other person who pulled and she hasn't filed yet. She has until February 15th. So we'll see what happens there. There is also a race for light board. Now there's several light board positions on the ballot. There are five and the, these, this one is a race. There's two two-year seats for one of the light board uh, vacancies. It's, it's hard to explain, but there's, there's basically um, five openings, but there's uh, a certain number of seats per opening. So this, this particular seat has two openings, but there are three men running. Jeffrey Geibel, I, I do not know uh, anything about Jeffrey's background, but he, he is officially a candidate. Um, and I apologize, I, I tried to reach him to, to just try to get a little bit of a bio on him, but I did not get, he did not get back to me in time for this, for this uh, report. But the other two candidates I do know for a fact are current members of the Light Board Advisory Committee, Stephen Kilonsky and Michael McCray. So, so we have three people running for two two-year seats on the Light Board, which is a race. That is the only race at this time in the current uh, upcoming election. So we'll see what happens. And I will be profiling them. I'll be, I'll be featuring anyone in a race will be featured in the Belmont Citizen Herald and with the local Belmont starting um, in our February, I want to say, I think it's the 25th, the February 25th edition will start featuring candidates in the races so that people can get to know them and make an educated decision on April 5th. And that's my election update. All right. And people have until February 15th. That's right. Now we have an update on the Belmont High School and um, Chenery project. Well, it's the Belmont Middle and High School project. It is a mouthful. <laughs> but I'll give you an update on that. So everybody knows that the 9 to 12 part of the building is currently open and they've started phase two of the construction, which is the grade seven and eight part of the building, which is supposed to be finished by fall of 2023. So what's happening is the Belmont Middle and High School Building Committee has been meeting and looking at you know, costs coming in the future and they wanna make sure that they stay on budget. They only have a certain amount. Uh, it's $295 million. It's what the debt exclusion includes and what the MSBA is giving them. So they cannot exceed that budget. But they also wanna make sure that when the project is done, they have a little left over as a contingency in case there's other things that come up and they might need to fix them. So what's happening is there's seven and a half million dollars that they're looking at in projected costs and trying to determine what can be cut so that in the end they can have about $776,000 left over to play around with. <laughs> 
So they haven't made decisions yet, but February 11th at 8 a.m. they have a meeting and they will make decisions. But what I will tell you is that they have been discussing a few items that most likely will not uh, be included uh, in the near future. So work west of Harris Field, which is three overlapping fields, that's gonna cost an, about $6.2 million. They are considering putting that on hold for now, just to save money. So set $6.2 million estimated for that work west of Harris Field is currently gonna be on hold. And the reason for that, Maribel, is because they're looking at um, putting a new rink there. So until the new rink is designed, it's really hard to, to plan west of Harris Field what they're doing because work that could be done may have to be changed when they build a new rink. So I think that's a wise decision and that is $6.2 million, which is a good amount. But then they still have a little more that they need to cut. So one of the things that we're looking at is rooftop solar panels. But I have to tell you, residents, more than 400 residents spoke up. They signed a petition. They sent multiple emails to Bill Lavallo, chair of the building committee, and said, do not cut the solar array from this project. It's estimated to cost $2.3 million. And it doesn't look like they're going to go in that direction, which is good news. And the reason, Maribel, is because if you cut the solar, even if you like put it on hold, it's going to cost the town hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So Believe it or not, electricity for that new building currently costs fifty thousand a month. I can't believe it, but that is what the facilities director said. So, so it's it's a lot of money, and the solar array, if they keep it, will will save the town money in the end. So, it looks like they're not going to cut that, but they are looking at um, other items, something you know that range from sixty seven thousand to a hundred thousand. Uh, it's just so they can make it to that figure of seven and a half million dollars. And like I said, they will make a decision by next Friday, which is the 11th at 8 a.m. And anyone interested should definitely tune in and I'll be writing about this as well. So read about it in the paper. Thank you, Joanna. And now you have an update on the public safety. Please share. I do. I do. So I actually check in with Lieutenant Kristen Daly every week to find out uh, what incidents occurred that the public overall should be aware of that impact their overall safety. So one of the things that I wanna make the public aware of is that there have been a lot of scams related to Medicare. So people might be calling you saying they're from Medicare, but they're really not. And they're asking, they're telling you that, um, you know, we wanna know if you got your card in the mail yet, or, you know, there are some changes to the plan that could save you money. And then they try to ask for personal information. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. So it, you know, it's it's a scam. And another scam, uh, Instagram. A lot of people's Instagram accounts may be getting hacked. Um, one person's Instagram account, she thought it was her friend, and they were asking her to invest in money, and she ended up transferring about eighty five hundred dollars, and then she found out it wasn't really her friend. Another scam is Microsoft. You might be on your computer and you'll get what appears to be something from Microsoft, a little pop-up window comes up and it's like emergency action, you know, take action immediately, emergency, emergency, right? So you call the number and then they're like, they instructed these residents and said, if we can fix this problem, but you need to send us gift cards. And they sent $3,500 in different kinds of gift cards. And then they, then they realized it was a scam. So they're out $3,500. That's another example. Another example is a Craigslist scam. A resident was selling a mattress for $400. A buyer offered to buy it for $1,500, saying it'll cover the cost of shipping. They sent a cashier's check. The resident deposited it, thinking it was legitimate. They shipped the mattress off. And then they learned from their bank that the cashier's check was fraudulent. So anytime you're selling something on Craigslist, someone offers you considerably more, it's definitely suspicious and make sure that check clears before you do anything. Another a scam, unemployment identity fraud. It's something to watch out for, particularly during tax season. One resident said she got a 1099 in the mail for unemployment that she didn't actually file for. So if you do get that, you, you call the Massachusetts Department of Unemployment and report it. 
And um, lastly, well, two, two other things. Students at the high school, uh, particularly students who play sports should be careful of their personal belongings. One girl, she did not lock up her backpack. She just left it by the track. It ended up getting stolen. You gotta lock up your personal belongings. And the other thing is uh, there was an attempted break-in on Sumner Lane through a second floor window. So I think, you know, if you have a second floor window, um, make sure you lock it. In this particular case, uh, it, it opened up and uh, an alarm did go off, but not from the window itself opening. Once the people got inside, the, uh, the alarm went off and alerted the owners of the home. And the way they got up to the second floor was just climbing from the patio onto the second floor. So just something to be aware of, lock your second story windows. All right, thank you, Joanna, for all this awesome news and good information for everybody. You're welcome. That's it for this week. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Maribel Carvajal de Salazar. See you next time.